Hey everyone, it's Jason, and welcome back to Six Siege, uh, the board game. Uh, so this is video part three, so part one, we went over a basic overview of the game, um, components, cook all the different stuff in there, um, then part two, we went through, started deep diving into the rules a little bit more, and part three here, we are now diving through the rest of the rules, because there's actually quite a bit. Um, but like I said in the original overview video is, once you start actually getting through the rules and you start knocking everything down, it the game flows pretty smooth, I think, for that stuff. Um, it's just a lot of little things where it's like, oh, you can do this, 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 this. Then you kind of figure it out. So um, in part part one of the rules, video part two, um, we looked over kind of like what the board layout meant. Um, just as a quick recap, in case you missed something, you want to go back. We went through... Uh, different structures on the board. Um, we went over movement around the board, and then we started going through attacking, like through the option of shooting. Um, so the shooting and movement were the first two of our actions we can perform um, each turn. So we just looked at our quick operators. We have movement, run, um, and we looked at shooting. So now we're going to actually go back up or go we're going to look at what Overwatch is, and then we'll go through our tactical gadgets, destroying, um, and special gadget effects. That'll be kind of what this video is about. Um, so Overwatch, I kind of want to say for itself, because it's actually a pretty interesting mechanic, but there's a little, little bit of nuance to it. So operators can use the Overwatch action from the main floor to watch an area compromised in multiple spaces in the operator's line of sight, extending in the direction shown by their Overwatch marker. Um, from the upper floor, Overwatch, one entryway space. In Overwatch, is said to be overwatching, and thus cover is Overwatch, blah, blah, blah. Very, you know, meh, stuff kind of gets where they have to, little nuance of main trip, all that stuff. Um, during the opposite, op, opposing squad's activation phase, the Overwatching opera can repost in spaces Overwatch. So, uh, you have a status marker, so what you'll do is... Move my uh, camera a little bit there. So if I have my orange recruit here and he is overwatching, um, uh, let's do this. If he's overwatching this room, he'll get his little tiny extra marker you can put in the front of his base to show he's overwatching. If a hidden operator is overwatching, they already have that attached to them. Um, an operator that is not will not have anything attached to them. Now, this is sort of like a little weird thing as a game. Come to those bases you can get. You can pop them off. If you're playing with the bases, because um, they have the names on them, the Overwatch token doesn't really fit with them. Um, they kind of designed that sort of like a weird flaw. Um, in that case, it's just remi reminders basically whatever direction they are facing. Um, again, yeah, so it's kind of an interesting thing there um so an operator performing overwatch action from the main floor of their miniature is overwatch direction so it's going to show you can be up down left right um whatever so what you can't be doing is your guy can't be facing up and you can't have your overwatch to the side you can't be angled diagonally um same thing here um basically you have to be in one of the four cardinal directions up down left or right when an operator performs overwatch action while in a leaning position, place the overwatch marker in front of their miniature. The miniature cannot be placed between the operator and their leaning standing. So that is, of course, just pretty much saying I can't have him leaning here. So if he's facing this direction, I could have him overwatching this way. I can't put my, now have the correct color, but I can't put the overwatch token I can't have him overwatching the direction he's obviously leaning from. You have to assume that he's leaning this direction out like this. So you're, he'd be overwatching into this room. Um, ending overwatch. An overwatch performs an action during their activation loses the overwatch status. So basically you can opt to not do anything. You can watch a room waiting for someone to like walk by. You might you need to play a shooter game. You can see that happening. You're kind of just watching the glory waiting for someone to walk by. But if you shoot or if you run or move, you also you're not watching that area anymore. Um, so overwatch markers and entryway overwatchers are not removed from the game board during the upkeep. 
Um, so when you're overarching, oh, operators cover a 180 degree arc, sending forward from their sec section covered by their overwatch marker. The operator watches all spaces in that arc and in, they're in their line of sight. Um, hidden overwatching operators automatically conclude their activation and overwatch action, reorientate re their hidden status to show the overwatch direction. Um, so here's what it's kind of showing here. So if uh, Smoke here is overwatching, he can only overwatch what he can see and what is in front of him uh, with his line of sight. So he can see straight forward, but he can't see either of these two because there's a wall. He can see all these three these spaces. Uh, if we mark his dot, it would actually mark this way. So he can see all the way this way. He can see all the way this way. I'm not 100% sure. I would agree that he could see that spot, but that's what they're saying. But again, he can't see through walls. He can't see left or right of him because he's looking forward. So it's just his red line here. It can only be stuff above that red line. Um, but again, he could see. Um, he could see up through up in here, but he can't see that spot because there'd be a wall in the way. Um, while overarching smoke monitors, all spaces are line of sight. By his imaginary covers, uh, covering by his Overwatch. Um, so if you're overwatching from the up upper stairs, reveal an Overwatch, reveal Overwatch operator. From the upper four, operators can only watch over one entryway space. Choose the entryway space you want your operator to overwatch. Then, if the entryway space does not already contain a token, place your spot there. So if my guy went upstairs, I could place his token here, showing he is watching this space. So if anyone enters that space, he's going to have that action. Um, if the space already contains an entry belonging to your squad, just replace it with a new one. Um, if it contains a space watched by another another player opposing, um, your operator speaks the entry of space. The player owning the existing token may agree to remove it from the game board, allowing your op operator to place your token in the normal way. No other effects. Otherwise, an exchange of fire is op is triggered between the two of you. If the dis disputed entryway uh, overwatch token belongs to a hidden operator, that operator must reveal themselves. If the token operator was a decoy, remove their entryway operator token and replace it with the disputed operator's token. Um, and then, hot, hidden overwatch operator. A hidden overwatch operator ends your activation with at least one of their hidden operator tokens in the upper four. IMAC performs an overwatch on the entry space or attempts to do so by speeding one of the other ones. Note, the hidden operator token moves to the upper floor. The already containing operator's second hidden operator token. You may redeploy the entry token at the end of their activation. Um, so basically what that means is that if... Um, we already have an orange one here, and I take my blue guy, I take him upstairs. Um, I can put my token on, like, that one over there, or I can put it on uh, one of the other ones. If I want to put it there, though, I can argue I'm watching this spot. And then now that means Castle here, the defending player, would have to say, oh, no, my guy's standing in there watching this hole, and that means, you know, I ran into you, now we're going to fight. Um, but he can instead say, Oh, no, no, I'm not watching that space anymore. You can have that. My guy's actually somewhere else upstairs. He's not in that spot anymore. Like, but you don't know that. You only know that he went up here, and you're assuming he's still kind of watching that spot. Um, it's another kind of decoy element. Uh, during exchange of fire, the players pause the game, perform a free shoot action, uh, target a point that disputed the entryway token. Um... The only the disputed one. So yeah, if they don't want to move their token, then they get a, sh get a shoot them, basically. Pretty easy. Um, if the passive players operate still in token, leave their entry token in their place, they almost they may also perform a free shoot action, targeting the operator, disputing the token. If the players are eliminated, put their token back in the box. Um, yeah, so like, blue player wants to dispute the orange ones, he can be like, hey, I'm going to be watching that spot. Is your guy actually there? And he's like, yes, it's there. I get to shoot him. If he lives, he can shoot back. Um, and then you resume your turn. 
If he's like, no, no, he's not actually there, then you just swap tokens out. So sometimes you have to debate whether it's worth trying that. Um, the term shot may refer to a shoot action of a repost in exchange of fire. Whenever an opponent stop, operator fires a shot from all the steps of a shoot action along the range for protection requirements applicable. All right, so this is the one of the cool parts about the Overwatch is the repost. Um, an Overwatch action may lead to repost, which can only be triggered during the opposing player's activation phase. If repost is a free shoot action. Do not remove the Overwatch token or marker after a repost. Hidden operators must reveal themselves. Um, so from the main four, an operator Overwatch in the main four may repost whenever an opposing player enters the space they're Overwatching or is present in a space they're still Overwatching after completing an action. It is possible to repost an opposing actor moves into a space on the main floor that contains an obstacle. Um, reposting from the upper floor. Um, anyone enters the entryway space, they're overwatching, or is present in the entryway space after completing an action. There's no limit to the number of times an operator can repost during an activation's turn. Um, so let's just show you this. So smoke on the bottom is, re uh, is overwatching all them areas we saw before. Um, and Ash leans into that area. So Smoke gets a free shot off when he gets a repost. After he's almost shot, Ash is still in play. He didn't die. For her second action, Ash shoots at Smoke. Smoke survives, and then therefore he can repost a second time because one action she moved over, then the second action she shot. So every time they do something in that line of fire, they get extra actions. So that makes the Overwatch mechanic very powerful. Um, because let's say this guy was standing right here watching this entire room. Oh, I got my camera up too high. Uh, he's watching this entire room. That means someone comes down this ladder, comes through this door, appears in this doorway, appears in this doorway, um, or through this wall. If they break through this wall or break, even break down this wall, this guy breaks down the wall. Um, he can now see him, right? Uh, so now you can see him, and now he gets a free shot at him. Um, but yeah, so it's it's, it's very cool, because it's you're sacrificing your ability to do other stuff to watch an area. And if you've played tactical shooters before, you're going to do that a lot. Sometimes you're going to sit there and be like, okay, this is probably the doorway they're going to come out of, um, or come through to get to the objective, so I'm going to watch it. Especially if you're doing, like... Um, like one of the, the hostages over here. We have the hostage guy, right? So we have the hostages in this room. So, yeah, your guy might stand back here and overwatch this entire room. Knowing that the attackers have to get into this room to, to get to them. So they're going to pop in. They're gonna, you're going to get at least a free shot off. Then they can shoot you. Maybe they eliminate you. Maybe they don't. But if they don't, then you get another free shot off them. So you might get two shots and take them out before they can get in there. So that means the attackers are going to almost have to, like, in this scenario, they're going to almost have to come from, like, the side um, or throw a grenade or something. Or on this particular board, there is an um, entryway down here. They can always pop into the back and try and go through the back window. Uh, so there's some different options there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a way to protect guys. So that's pretty cool. Um, all right, then we're looking at tactical gadget actions. Each charge cube in a tactical inventory represents potential use tactical gear. To perform a tactical gadget, you must spend your charge cube from the desired uh, gadget, remove the charge, put it back in the box. So we haven't looked at these yet. Um, I kind of skipped over some of these. So each team has their own little tactical inventory of special things. They get a certain number of cubes. The orange player gets four cubes used at the beginning of the game during setup, and they can put them on whatever they would like. Um, and it'll tell you where they actually start off. So it's just setup, this begins at the beginning of the game. So if they take two bulletproof cameras and a deployable shield, they get to remove these from the map, or from the thing, and they get to place them out. Otherwise, they have throwables they can use later on. Um, and we'll look in more in depth on how all these work. The uh, attacking team gets six charges. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. They also always get all three drones to use. 
Um, but there are lots of depo deplorable, deployables and throwables. Um, yeah, they're going to get some other different stuff there. So this is one of their different actions they can use, which is a communal one. All the different attackers, all the defenders get these communal abilities. Then there are special gadgets, which are only used by operators that own them. Um, do I have an operator here? I can... Oh no, I just knocked something on the floor. I was trying to grab a operator card here quick. Um... Yeah, form operator special gadget action may only apply one of their special gadget effects preceded by the action for attacker or orange for defender. If the black action uh, icon is preceded by a struck out charge cube, you must spend a charge cube from the relevant profile, apply the effect, and put it back in the box. So for here we have Twitch. He has shock drones. So he'll have two charges at the beginning of the game. He has to spend one to use his blue action. To place a drone, um, and then it gets to do all this different stuff. And then, um, I said, he, is, it, it, he she, it looks like. And then you move one of the charges. So, Twitch can only use this ability twice per game. Um, yeah. So, black just means action in general, and then the colors are just referencing each character. Um... Special gadgets not pursued by action or reaction are permanent. They are applied no need to spend actions or made active. Um, we also have destroy actions. An operator performing destroy action applies a destruction rating showing on their operator profile to all destructible elements, i.e. a strength rating in the targeted space. Some gadget effects also require an operator to perform free destroy, destroy actions when they are applied, which is a gadget's destruction, such as like grenades. Um... Targeting destroyed actions performed by activated. When performing destroyed actions, operator must target a central dot in the space of the line of sight. Uh, determine the affected elements, the gadget, targeted space, all partition, partitions in the targeted space. Note, if you perform a destroyed action in a space containing an operator, the action does not affect any gadgets represented on the profile. Um... So it's just the same. So one section of the partition belongs to two orthogonal spaces. The two section provide edge to four. So if I'm trying to destroy this wall, I have to target one of these four spaces. I have to be able to reach one of them. So if I'm meleeing, I can be right next to it, essentially. If I have, like, a ranged, like, grenade or something, I have to still be able to target one of these spaces. So... I wouldn't be able to target this space right here because my op my other operators are. I can't target the space that he's in. Um, so a double wall, that's not as big of an issue. But if we were looking out like one of these solo ones and there was a barricade here. I have a door barricade somewhere. So if I have my two operators in here, um, this guy here could break down this door because he's next to it. This one would not be able to break this down with like a throwable because he wouldn't be able to target that side of the door. Uh, he'd have to move out of the way first and then he could throw something. Um, but then the other thing you should keep in mind, they have to have that icon. So they have to be able to use at least a yellow destruction, which is everyone has that. So down there it's going to say destroy has a little yellow arrow. Some guys will have higher ratings to destroy higher things. Um, so like the wall there, you would not be able to use a dest regular destroy action to do it. You'd have to have something special to destroy that wall. Um, and it's basically just saying, if you have red, red can destroy. Um, like, yellow can only destroy yellow. Orange can destroy yellow. And orange, red can destroy everything. Uh, elements with no strength rating, such as obstacles and heavy walls are indestructible. Bulletproof, gadgets only. The bulletproof attribute does not apply... To destroy actions when performed by operators exactly the same way. Actions performed by an operator with a bulletproof gadget only if the operator performing as adjacent has a necessary destruct rating or if it's triggered. So what this means is we will have some of these cameras that will have a little bulletproof symbol. So it has to be a yellow destroy, but it's also bulletproof, so they have to be next to it. I Meaning basically someone has to run up and actually smash this, whereas you can shoot through a wall. Um, but we do have other cameras. 
they're a little less durable and they don't have that bulletproof icon. You can shoot a regular camera uh, versus you can't shoot the bulletproof camera. Um, if the Gestrite Elmo is a gadget, put it back in the box. Single or double barricade, put it back in the box, reveal in the two space two spaces section it previously occupied. Um, the space is thus revealed as representing a single or double door or window. Single or double wall, place a breach icon where it was. Fairly simple. Use action, destroy stuff. Um, so here it's just showing here. For so I just current space, he can destroy the camera one. Because he has a line of sight to the central god. He can destroy the light wall on the right, number two, uh, because he has the orange destruction area, but he cannot destroy three uh, because he has no line of sight to them. Because there's an obstacle in his way on this one, or there's a corner of a wall there. Fairly simple. Um, we have reactions, uh, repost, which we already talked about, and gadget effects that have reaction. If the reaction is, has a struck out charge, you must use a charge cube to be able to do it. Um, when a position react, you're responsible for announcing exactly when you want to perform a reaction. If you want to take a moment to consider whether or not to react, you must first tap the timer so that your own time is counting down. So this happens if you're doing the timer. So it's the opponent's turn, and let's say, um, I don't know exactly for reaction, but just as a hypothetical, they move in to, um, the room that you're in, right? Or the room adjacent to you. Moving the room adjacent to you, and you have a reaction that lets you, you know, uh, throw, as soon as you have line of sight of them, you can throw a grenade, right? Again, I'm not sure anyone has this exact ability, but just saying. You want to decide if you want to spend that charge on them or if you want to save that charged ability for someone else. Um, you have to then switch to your timer. So now it's back on. So if, if the, it was the defender's turn, they move. The attacker wants to decide, like, if they want to do it. If they're me, like, I'm going to do this action, then they can just go ahead and do it. Um, but if they're going to be like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to, you have to flip to your time, and you're spending your activation time doing it. Um, so switching a timer on reaction is turn. Before triggering a reaction, the passive player taps the continued attacker defense operation. This stops the active player's timer, starts their own timer. The passive player at this point may take some time to decide whether to react, but their own timer will be kicking down. After making their decision, the passive player taps continue and restarts, and then the play resumes normal. If two operators are able to react, resolve each action fully applying all effects one after the other in order. Um, all right. So that's all our different actions we have in the game. Um, I just want to go through this really quick. Uh, listed here, yeah. Yeah, so we have all our different actions. Move, run, overwatch, shoot, tactical gadget, special gadget, and destroy. Um, we kind of went through most of this. Went through all our, our different defenses. We went through different obstacles. Um, some of the different other things we have to go through are just what the, all, all the different gadgets and stuff do. Um, I think I might save that for when we look at the operators and stuff. We'll put them in their own video because um, it's kind of a specialty thing. Um, so the other thing we want to look at is I know we have challenges and we will look at some of the game setup and operations. Um, so let's look at challenges quick then we'll jump back into kind of setup. So what can be challenged? Shots and other game effects. Uh, shot by operators can always be challenged, then player checks the condition announced. All their game effects require a line of sight. Challenging a shot, the line of sight rules, rule to check if line of sight is valid. If the line of sight is confirmed to be valid, complete the shot, then check the target's actual protection rating um, to see if it matches. So first make sure they can actually hit them. This is basically if somebody is, you know, whatever, however we have these guys. If he's way over here, and she's right he's right down here you can basically be like if if blue is shooting orange he can be like or she's like i don't know if you can actually hit me like there, yeah there's a wall that there so you can shoot through it he might be like ah this corner of this wall might be in the way um this is then when you would oh challenge that shot and drop my ruler Ugh. 
so if they did that, um, you actually pause the game to check all this, I believe. Um, but the first thing I do is check the line of sight. Um, but you have to announce everything else, like what's in the way and all this stuff. So you want to check that line of sight. So we're going to start with this, guys. And we're going to move this barricade out of the way. And we're going to drop this here. And then we match up those two lines. It's going to show that it is clear. So like he goes all the way through. He doesn't hit this part of the wall. So that would be a clear shot. So that would continue through. Um, then you go, so if this matches, uh, then you check for um, protection. You check the target's actual protection rate if necessary. Drawing a line of cover to the weaning. Character says again, weaning stuff. Check a lot of stuff. If this matches the value announced by the shooter, the state of protection radius is confirmed and must be applied when resolving the target. Um, so this is, if he's shooting him, he has to be like, I'm shooting you from there and you're gonna, like, you have that protection. Like, and then he, obviously there, if we're actually playing this for sure, he would be like, there would be this table here. He'd be like, you're gonna take, wall that, take a shot uh, at three protection. Cause you get two for this, two for this, which adds up to three cause it's only light or heavy. Um, but yeah, it says, if it does not match the value announced by the shooter, ignore the state of protected rating and apply the actual rating when resolving the shot. Um, if the line of sight is strong to be invalid, the shot has no effect to result of the shoot action, the action is still spent. So if he was over here, it probably would hit that wall and he would be like, oh no, it didn't line up. Um, yeah, so that's how that's works. So apply the consequences of the challenge. If both conditions are announced by the challenge player are confirmed, that player may immediately add 30 seconds to their own timer or deduct 30 seconds from the opponent's timer. If either or both of the conditions declared by the challenge player are invalidated, then the opponent gets to decide whether to add or subtract 30 seconds. So this is what is very, um, very precise. Like this, this game is all about like doing stuff quick. You're always on a timer, so you want to keep moving. Um, so it's kind of like, oh, I move him here. Uh, I'm going to shoot this guy. Uh, and you're trying to add it up really quick. Like, I would say he's going to take three protection. And then the guy's like, I don't think you can hit me. Pause the timer. Uh, let's check our... Move these guys out of the way. Check our line of sight. And it's going to be like, oh, no, it didn't go. That shot missed. You hit the wall instead. So then now this guy just be like, haha, that was worth it for me to, to do that. Um... And now he can either give himself 30 more seconds to use, or he can subtract 30 seconds. The problem is you run out of time, you don't have any more actions to do. So it can be very valuable to check that. But there's also that penalty that if you, if he was on this space again, right, and he called for it, and he was wrong, then now he could potentially lose stuff or gain the advantage to the attacker. So you... It's not saying you don't want to call people out and make sure they're not saying something incorrect, but there's the risk of doing it too much because if you're just hoping the other person's not going to call you out and they do, you could end up in a bad situation or versus them or vice versa. Um, so it says challenging other game effects. Uh, again, pause and resolve the game effects in the same procedure, skipping the protection rating check and related consequences. Um, if, you know, if the action is challenged and the line of sight is found to be invalid, the action, the charge cube where actable is still spent. If the line of sight for action is found to be invalid, the charge cube is still spent. So, kind of the same thing. You spend an action or a cube or anything else and your shot or your action doesn't actually succeed, then you lose. And then it's just kind of, here. the next thing you're kind of just showing if they're hitting the line of sights. Um... And we're going to talk about gadgets really quick. I'm not going to get into the in-depth on each one. We just want to talk about what they are. General remarks on gadgets. Uh, players may deploy various gadgets. Ground deployed gadgets are represented by tokens, which can be placed on any space in the main floor. So, for example, we could have a claymore or a... Um, I forgot what that one is. Uh, we have one of those guys. Uh, and if it gets out of my way, we also have barbed wire. Uh, which is bulletproof as well. So those guys would just be like, someone drops barbed wire, they can just drop it on one of the tiles. 
you know, wherever it needs to go. Um, Wall-mounted gadgets are represented by miniatures can be placed on any section of a heavy wall. However, unlike barricades which belong to two spaces, wall-mounted gadgets only belong to a single determined by the ori orientation. When you deploy a wall-mounted gadget, you there must orient the gadget to the front facing outwards. So we looked at our camera before, so you have a little arrow on the base, kind of showing where it's at, so I could apply this just like that. So that way you put it like in the middle of the base. Um, depending on which direction you want to be facing. Do you want to watch that room or do you want to watch this room? Um, it's not possible with two wall mounted gadgets on the same heavy wall section. So what this means is I can't, you can't do this. Um, kind of, kind of, I guess, maybe a little ridiculous that I can't, but the thing is if I'm in this room and I'm going to deploy it, if I put, and my table fell apart, if I put this camera here, doing this one, I do this one, it's the same effect as if I would have had it here. Because it covers the entire room area. It doesn't really matter which wall it is for those purposes. The only way it's going to really make a difference is for something like this. It's bulletproof because a guy has to get to it. So if you put it on a harder to reach room. Um, but I think that's just, you know, just to make it easier. Um, yeah, so it's pretty, pretty simple there. Um, then they have their different eye concept. Some are bulletproof. Uh, some have always, some are electronic. Some ga gadgets are only affected by this type of gadget and uh, always visible. Line of sight, targets that are not blocked by operators or smoke or gas overlays. So if you look at the cameras, they're going to have the little eye symbol. So you can always see the camera no matter what. And you also are affected by electronics. Um, and the bulletproof one's the same way. There are some other ones we have that are a little bit smaller. So like these ones are a little bit more hidden. They don't have that always visible because they're a little bit shorter. So they could be hiding behind stuff or the cameras are mounted up higher on the wall. Um, I haven't showed off one of those yet either. We have a little tiny barricades. Um, Strength ratings and destruction rating. Uh, gadgets or partitions with the strength can be destroyed by gadgets with these, and then destruction rating is showing how much they can destroy. So one might be showing, if it doesn't have the destruction symbol, it's showing that's how much damage it can take. Um, and then some of them might show a symbol showing that that's how much they can destroy. Um, so I don't have one of those immediately regable, regable ready for me. Um, uh, gadgets not represented by physical components placed on the game board do not come towards space limit. A grenade can be thrown into a barbed wire token. Uh, if a gadget uses a hit dice, tap the pause while you roll the die. Protection only applies if the inflicted shots. Uh, hits inflicted by hit dice rolled for a fragging never are mitigated by protection. Some are activatable gadgets. Some characters have tokens that have little activatable token things. Um, multiple spaces area of effect. Some gadgets affect the area consisting of multiple spaces extending from the targeted space. Uh, these spaces are collectively for an area of effect. Um, the effect applies to simultaneous all areas, unless otherwise stated. The effect applies to operators in both squads. Roll the dice separately for each operator required to roll a hit. Um, if the area effect is in a room, apply the effects to all spaces of the room. And some gadgets have overlay keyword. There are effects occupied by an overlay. So what this means is a camera. I'm going to scooch all this other stuff off the board. Just, just to make it. So if I have this camera on this wall here, it watches the entire room. So anyone went through, so if a, if the blue player played it and then this guy's token walks in, he's immediately going to get revealed by that camera. And we flip over, we see it's the recruit, we swap him out, right? So it's automatically done. Now, it's other thing is saying that if you throw a grenade, um, and these guys happen to be standing each other, and this guy chucks a grenade into this room, the grenade doesn't care whose side you're on. It's going to hit both players. Um, so you got to be cautious with that. Are you willing to risk your teammate for a uh an extra kill maybe he has full health and he can afford to take two hits off of a grenade but he's almost dead because he just shot him 
it might be worth that risk. Um, so that's more or less what that's saying. Um, for gadget cubes, we have some overlays. Um, overlays are fun. So if we throw a smoke grenade, um, and you target this spot here, we're going to put a smoke screen in there, which now blocks people that stand in them areas. Um, they also have the half wall ones, so you can put those up against uh, some other various spots like that that they might not be able to normally fit through, um, depending on where they go. So area effect overlay, either two or four spaces. Um, you must place the widest possible overlay. One of the spaces occupied by the overlay must be the space targeted by the gadget. Overlays must not pass through partitions, breaches, windows, or obstacles. Uh, multiple overlays have to not have overlapping area of effects. So it's kind of showing here. So if, if I target this spot here, I have to put this so one of these four sides have to be in that spot. It can be this one, could be this one, could be this one, could be this one. Doesn't matter. If I target this spot here, I can't put this guy there this way because it'll be covering the wall. I have to put the widest thing. So it's going to have to be something like that. Um, but depending on where you target, you might not be able to do that. So that's saying if I target this spot down here, I'm not going to be able to put this guy in here no matter what. There's no way because he'll be outside of one of the walls. That's where you have to use this one. So you have to cover that direction, cover like that, could cover like that way. So pretty much those are the three. I guess you could technically cover it like that as well. Um, I don't know how useful that would be, but you could possibly do that. But as long as one of the sides are part of it. I guess actually that one, I could do it that way. Um, so that might not be the best example. Now, obviously it means I can't throw one in here because there's no way for me to possibly get a thing inside one of those areas. Um, yeah, so that's just showing those different things. You have to be able to place as best as possible. Um, so remember to move overlays from the game board and return the general supply during the upkeep phase. Line of sight target. Must target a spacing line of sight. An operating upper floor has a line of sight to all gray entryway area spaces. Throwables. Gadgets must be thrown in a target space in a line of sight with a maximum of six spaces. Operators in smoke or gas overlays do not block the line of sight. So I am throwing this, I can throw it over, I, I perceive I'm just throwing, I don't care if there's smoke here, you know, this guy can throw it one, two, three, four, five, six spaces down here. He doesn't character smoke because he's just throwing it through that. Smoke isn't going to prevent that from landing where it needs to be. Um, wave, uh, this gadget must target a space from the maximum range of four spaces Ignoring any partitions, operators, and smoke uh, or gas overlays. So the two difference between a throwable and a wave, I skipped deployable for a moment. The difference between throwable and a wave is a throwable kind of like big arcing chuck, right? They're throwing it up and over. A wave is kind of more of like, um, I would say kind of like thought, think of like an I know these aren't energy weapons, but think of it something like that. Because it's going to be able to go through partitions. Um, so yeah, it's kind of going to be like sending out like a, like a signal, like a sound wave. Like that's probably what you're probably thinking of. Not maybe energy weapons, but like a sound wave. Like a wall isn't going to necessarily protect you from a sound wave. Um, in deployable, it's not very made to play a deployable gadget in the adjacent space. Um... Upper four, only put it in the neutral entryways. Um, vertical, this gadget must be from upper four, but can target any space in a uh, room with the little arrows. Drone, this gadget is a deployable. Once deployed, it can move, spending up to five movement points. Drones cannot pass obstacles, enter space to gain barbed wire tokens, or move upper floors. They can, however, enter, enter spaces occupied by operators. On any of its movement, the drone scans the room all around it, and opposing operators receive a located marker. 
uh, and that are revealed. Uh, players may use a drone marker in the general supply to show the drone's movement, return the marker to supply act, completing the stand. Yeah, so you get this little drone token, you can kind of move around. And we did look at the tactical inventory. The attackers get three deployable drones every game. Um, and then we have just some more specific setups for some of them. Um, which I'm not going to get into all of them right now, but we have like entryways, barbed wires, deployable shields, we have the cameras. Um, deployable shields are going to kind of, they're going to look like these, you get little miniature shields. Which have their bulletproof and strength rating, but someone can possibly jump over them, gives a guy an extra shield. Bulletproof cameras, nitro cells, uh, impact grenades. Um, and in blue we have the breachable charges, tactical drones, frag grenades flashbang grenades, uh, smoke grenades, and some claymores. These are all the different tactical inventories. And then every character has their own individual special stuff as well. Um, all right, so we went over all the main components of the game. Um, I didn't show off these. We do have other different walls we can build up throughout the game. Um, these are deployable walls. Um... Are put up through the game. See, they have a red rating, but you can put them up in various areas to block stuff. The little triangles you show that you can shoot through them, they can go in doorways. Uh, then we also have uh, extra walls you can put up. So this way you can take a light wall and turn it into a heavy wall. Um, or I believe they can, like, go on wall spots, but I'm not positive, but if not, you can always put it like that, too, as well, and build, like, put a wall there. This is setup stuff, um, so I'm going to jump back to that, so I did not go through the setup stuff at all. I skipped over all that. I want to get into the, the nitty-gritty of the game. Uh... All right, so here we go for game setup. It says, in the mission guide, choose one of your different, your environment, your board, and your different missions. First few games, you recommend picking control mission and the console environment, which has starter stuff. Um, place all the board game elements represent a chosen environment in the middle of the table. Place the device in which you installed your app near the board, if you're using the app, uh, together with the line of sight and the seven hit dice. Uh, from the general supply board, put all the breach standees, wound tokens, located standees, stun markers, um, along with the drone marker and overlays. So all the stuff that people might need to grab. Place a round tracker on the first space of the zero. So if we go over the board there, we have a round tracker over there. Uh, keep track of our six rounds. Um, then place all of your obstacles. Um... Now, obstacles, the only thing, again, that matters is one dot is for a one square object, two dots is for a long one. The actual image or what object it is does not necessarily matter. Uh, lastly, set up the following requirements instructed in the mission guide. Bomb, hostage, control tokens, uh, barricade standees, five camera miniatures, or in case instructed, barbed wires, except for control and fortified entryways. So if we look back at our mission guide... So I'm just going to look at one of these uh, hostage ones here. So to set up the board is basically, for this, it's going to show you where all your cameras are, where they're facing. Um, and you can see we have a camera in the woods. It's going to show you where you place barbed wires on different stuff. Um, now you do notice, and just to point this out, there's a barbed wire right there. They have it on top of one of the entryways. So that's kind of an interesting way to do that. Like, it's cool that you can do that. They put barricades up on some of these different doors and windows so they can't get through. So that's, again, kind of showing our map here. They have a barricade right here on this window so they can't get in directly there. They have one um, over on the side one. Uh, they're not as worried about putting them on the inside doors on here. They're just on the outside trying to prevent... So once they get in... Like, basically, it's blocking off all their different exits or entrances uh, to get in. So, they want to get through, they're going to have to use the roof accesses. Or, they're going to have to break through um, 
one of the doors or windows. Now it's showing the bomb hostage. Now it has two different ones. Because just like a... Um, just like the defenders, they get two tokens. So you don't know which one is which. So the attackers can see there's a guy there, a guy there. But they don't know which one to go after to begin with. Um, but yeah, you're going to place all these different tokens. Now this map does also show a yellow dot down here. It says optional module. Um... Now, terror space where the hostage code can be placed by the yellow mo marker. Now, granted, once you play this a couple of times, you can make up your own thing. This is just showing, here's all your different tokens. Here's how you're going to use these different stuff. Uh, we have some fortified entryways. Um, I'm sorry, I saw, I saw those are barbed wire in them corners. Those are fortified entryways. They put the barbed wire in front of the windows. Um, but yeah, there's some different options to do stuff there. Um, squad selection, player side, attacker, defender will be, take five, se secretly from their respective squads, picking five available attackers. And save time by playing the pre-made selections in the starter zones if you'd like. Uh, operators each represent their place their token under each profile. Uh, the person supply a reroll token, overwatch markers, entry markers, leaning statues, tackle inventory board is placed. Each player secretly places charge keeps in whichever free, free slots they choose. Defender gets four, attacker gets six, also three on them. So they said, basically in here they're saying, pick your characters, you know, without the other player knowing, and put your charges without the other player knowing. Now, there's really nothing in the game that has a way for you to, like, conceal. There's no, like, board for you to hide your stuff. Um, that's one thing I'm surprised they didn't come with for, um... Some of that stuff, so that way you can't look over at your opponent and see, like, oh, they have, you know, two claymores left, or they have three frag grenades. That would have been kind of cool if they had little screens you could at least put on your side of the board. To at least if nothing else, hide your tactical inventory. But I could also see having something, like, one or two screens to hide your player boards. Because they'd be able to see, oh, okay, I know he has blitz on the field, right? Um, if you play a game enough, you might know what Blitz can do. But if they hid the information so maybe you didn't know how many of his charges he used, you know, or for example, if we had we had Twitch out here, if I have him on the I have her out on the board, my opponents can be able to see if I have one or two actions left. Instead of just having to kind of be paying attention. Plus they're also gonna know what my range is. They're gonna know that like Oh, at, at far range, she's fine, but as she gets closer... Now, again, this, I think, would come with... If you play the game a lot, you play all the characters, you'd eventually start knowing which characters are good at what and how many they do. Um, but yeah, having that as hidden information the entire game could definitely be a game-changer. Uh, but no, it doesn't come with anything for that. Um, place your charge keys on your operator, get your profiles, all that. Then the game settings. So, um... Managing time and game work gap. For even more experienced play, um, use the companion app. If you're unable to use it, there is a no app variant, which we will look at. Um, open the app, set the number of players, their names. Each player begins with different setting of time. Beginner, kill, standard, or extreme. Um, and then the, the speed setting affects the deployment time and the game time allocated to each operator. For a balanced game, players should choose the same setting. However, veteran players can play at their handicap by picking more demanding speeds. So it's also a really cool effect if you do use the app, um, is that you can set different difficulty levels for each player. Um, although it does say, for your first speed games, we recommend playing with the no time or choosing speed limit one, just because then you have more time to act, activate and do stuff. Um, if you use a pre-made deployment and skip the deployment. Um, tap the deployment button. During each uh, during deployment, players must comply with the app applicable area capacity, meaning candidates are stacked on top of each other, and operators may be placed in leaning positions. Defender's deployment. Uh, defender, when playing as a defender, deploy your operators and gadgets in the order shown below. Operators and gadgets cannot be placed in the perimeter spaces. So first you do, your defender may reposition or remove from the game board up to five of the following components cameras barbed wire four to five entries or barricades so if you didn't like that setup you can move these up to five of these things around or just completely remove them from the game if you would like so what that's kind of saying is 
I'm playing this, like, I have, like, okay, if I move my opera, my hostage over here, I might want to move one of my cameras over there too then. Um, but it could be as simple as saying you have some of these doorways. Is Let's say you have this guy here and you have some of the stuff. Maybe you just want to remove this doorway because you'd like to maybe try and trick them into walking this way or remove this one. So it might you might be trying to funnel them one direction or the other by removing one door or moving this door down to here instead. Um, you have different options. It's kind of cool. They have the actual setup, and then you can kind of change it around if you like. Um, place all your gadgets to have special setup, which might be additional cameras. Um, so if we're using this one, we have, if you have more bulletproof cameras or deployable shields, you can place more of those to start out with. Um, I don't know if any of the operators themselves have special ones. They might, though. Or setup ones, they might. Uh, if you have chosen bulletproof cameras or available shields, and your tactical will remove them, put them on the board. Then place your 10 hidden operator tokens on a free space on the board, and the or in orange spaces in the upper four. For each space in your finger's upper four, uh, also place an entry rate token. Um, here's a big thing. So when the defender deployment time has run out, or if the de defender taps can kill the attacker's de button, blah, blah, Caps continue the attacker's deployment is the attacker's turn uh, to deploy their assets in, within a set time limit. So, kind of showing on here is in standard mode, the defenders get 15 minutes to set up the board, and then they'll have one minute during the game per operator. So, if they have five operators, they'll have five minutes each turn. Um, but then the attackers only get five minutes to deploy all their stuff. So, it gives the defender 15 minutes like in the standard mode, to, do I want to move this here? Do I want to move that there? Where do I want to place my 10 different guys? The attackers don't get that much time, but they also don't have the extra potential setup stuff to do. Um, when the defenders finish their deployment, the attacker places their five operators and their overwatch markers in the primitive space. So they cannot deploy operators in the upper port. So that's all they have to do is figure out where they want to place five guys. Never resolve actions Reaction to reveal hidden operators during the deployment phase. You must wait until the attacker's first activation. So what this is basically saying is, if on the first turn I put this guy here, I deploy my guy right... No, well, I can't see him. He's too far down. I deploy my guy here. He doesn't... And there's no window here. He doesn't automatically reveal him. So then the uh, defender... You know, if they put their guy here, for whatever reason, they put right in front of a window. I, I deploy my guy here. First activation this guy goes, he can, I can see you. Now you have to flip yourself over. So, that's where, you know, the attackers get a little... They can see where they're... Hey, you guys are poking your head out of a window? That's kind of dumb. I'm going to shoot you in the face right away. Um, deployment timeout. The live time to go squad runs out before they have completed their deployment action, collecting the game components not yet set up and put them back in the box. So this is very important. Um, while you are deploying all your stuff, if you are the defender and you are putting out cameras and um, your different things and different operators and stuff, and you run out of time because you're just not paying attention, you might not have all your cameras put out. You might not, especially because you have to do it in order. You have to move stuff, then put your stuff, then put your attackers, um, or your, your defenders out, your hidden operators. If you're not paying attention and you put out um, four of the five characters and you're just debating on the fifth one, your timer runs out, you don't get that fifth character. He apparently didn't show up to the battle. Same thing goes for attackers. Um... Yeah, so it's kind of crazy, right? Um, each player must complete their two activation phases within the limited time, defined by the number of operators still at play at the start of the round. Uh, players allocate time between their activation phases as they see fit. So this is saying you have five, like I said, you have five, one minute per act per player. That's five minutes total. That's between first and second activation. That's not five minutes for the first one, five minutes for the second one. So if you activate you know, one guy in the first one, and then you let the other player go, you still have, you know, four minutes on the remaining one. 
You might have more than that because it might only take me 30 seconds. Um, when you activate, flip your thing over. So, act, attackers go first. The attacker moves around until it can forward one space. Start around. Fully activates between one and three other operators. Remember, an activation is a move and up to two other actions. Now, you don't have to take all of them. Um, but you can't bounce back and forth between one guy to the other. So if I start with uh, Blitz here, I have to do... I can move, I can attack, I can use an action, I can move again. But I can't move him, then... Oh, I'm going to switch over to my other guy, move him around, then come back and move him. You have to complete all actions with one guy at a time. Um, and then the attacker and the defender's operation. If a player... With a squad of three or more operators activates all their operators during their first activation phase, they'll skip their second active activation phase. Um, so you have, to, you have to move it, do at least one thing, you have up to three. Um, but if you have less than three, then you can skip the other one. Um, note if a player with a squad of five operators chooses to activate only one operator in their first activation phase, they will be they will be able to activate only three of their four available operators in their second phase. So, yeah, this is kind of showing on this as a reminder. So, round one, you, have, you can activate between one and three operators. And then in round two, you can zero to three. But it's saying, again, if you activate one character in here, you know, and you only have four guys, you could activate the other three in here. But if you only activate one and you have five... You only activate up to three more, so you can't act. You can't save all your activations for the second one. Um, and then your finger goes one to three, and the attacker goes, you know, fairly fairly easy there. Then your finger uh, activation timeout. When a player's activation timer expires during one of their activation phases, if one of their operators was in the process of performing action, action complete the action, unless it was a movement, in which case leave the operator in the last phase. So if you're in the middle of like. Um, doing a lean action or a shoot action, finish it out first. Uh, but you do not activate any more operators. They may still react, but they can no longer take time to, th but they can no longer take time to think first. Um, so they don't have any more time left on their clock. So that was another thing we talked about: is that if you need to react, you can pause it and react, but you, it takes up your activation time. If the attacker's time expired during their first activation phase, the defender plays both of their activation. Activation phases one after the other. Um, yeah, very simple. So then, upkeep is the last phase. Uh, check the mission's victory condition if you've won in the game. Otherwise, move, remove any located markers, stun markers, or overlays from the game. Uh, so that's step only last one round. Flip the operator's activation tokens to show their operator available side. And reset all activatable gadget tokens to their ready side. Um... For each operator eliminated during the current round, tap one of the outlines for the relevant squad in the app, and the app automatically adjusts the activation for each player coming in. So that's, again, showing that once you're down to three players, now you only have three minutes. Down to four, you only have four. So every time you lose players, you lose extra time to do stuff. Um, yeah, so that's all of our different active. Just basically the setup. Follow the map, place your guys out, and then keep your gameplay going. We do have some things we need to look at here. Fair play and pauses. Anytime during deployment and play, players may request a pause to resolve any rule interpretation. Simply tap the pause button. Effects and rules. Some effects, particularly those described in operative profiles, conflict with or modify the normal rules. Such effects prevail, prevail over normal rules and limited components. You're supposed to place a game component, but no more available. No substitutes are allowed. So this is saying if I need to place um, an extra camera, and there's already three cameras out because I don't have any more, you can't use any more. Um, so, like, you have operators that maybe, like, if you place it at the beginning of the game, you placed three barbed wire, and there's only three barbed wire in the game, and you, for some reason, are an operator that lets you place barbed wire, you don't have any more unless one gets destroyed. Um, and back in the box, get through stuff so they can't be used till the end of the game. Um, reroll. Each player has a single reroll token. When shooting, you may declare your intention to use a reroll token. On Spanish token, you may keep any one guy and reroll all others. 
add together any new results, and then get rid of the token. The no app variant. There are two different ways to do this. You're unable to use your app or prefer not to. Um, you can use two conventional stopwatches or a chess clock or the equivalent smartphone app replicating the speed, just as long as you have something that goes back and forth for the timers. Um, but instead of having like their little clocks, you're just going to have um, your timer set up for defending appointments. So it's, you know, 20, 15, 15, or 8, or different stuff. Or you can play the full no app. Um, this variant changes some of the core rules. During the setup phase, place the 10 bonus tokens in the general supply. Deployment and activations are not subject to time limits. This is why they recommend maybe starting with this. Because then you're not being, you get idea of how to play the game before you worry about adding time limits to this. When you win a challenge, instead of gaining or losing time, you receive a bonus token, which you should place. Uh, plus one side profile of the operators is either in the process of being activated or has not yet been activated, or a minus one on the profile of any opposing operator that is in the process of being activated or has not been activated. Um, so what this means is if one, if, if blue guy challenges orange guy, right, and he loses, blue guy loses, uh, so orange guy just to decide to either place a plus one or a minus one action either on blue guy who is um, choosing, who is uh, the attacking, or he could place it on any other guy that has not yet activated. If this guy's already taking his full turn, he can't get tokens. You can't give a minus token to someone um, that's already activated or a plus token to someone that's already activated. You go back and give someone another activate another action. Once their turn's done, they're done. Um, no more than two bonus tokens may be placed on a particular operator. If the same token, a plus one, minus one, they cancel each other out. So that way, if, like, you challenge someone and they, oh, high one, I get a plus one, and then they haven't used it yet, and then they get challenged and they get a minus one, it'll just negate it. Um, operator begin their activation with one or two act plus tokens. Uh, may perform one or two bonus actions. Every action selected by the operator, including bonus actions, must be different. On uh, completing, completing the activation phase, remove the tokens. Um, if they have the minus one, they perform minus one action. Uh, remove the token from the profile. Um, operators receive a second minus one token immediately flip their activation token to show its operator's active side. Um, it will not be possible to activate the operator during the current round and their minus one action token to the general supply. Because you get your move and then you have two other actions. So if you get both of, if you have two minus tokens, you cannot perform that turn. Um, so that's actually pretty cool as well. So it's a different way um, to just play without all the different stuff. If you win a challenge but no bonus tokens, may the general supply take any bonus token already on operator profile and place it either side on operator of your choice. Um, and during upkeep their room. So I'm using during your turn, you lose them. So that's definitely a cool little different mechanic. So instead of that time thing, um, you're going to play the entire game normally. You just don't have a time element to it. But if you do do challenges, you're going to give people actions instead of extra or subtracting their time. Um, there is a couple of special modules. Uh, we have forward planning. You might give the defender a far greater control over the environment during the setup phase. During the mission selection step, carry out the steps process without placing any bomb miniatures or hostage tokens. Then start the timer and configure the defender's deployment, making the following changes. The defender may place the bomb miniatures uh, in any spaces, so you can place the stuff wherever you want. May reposition and move up to 10 rather than 5 components. And the defender may place one fortified wall token on any section of a light wall. Okay, so it has to be specific in that wall. Um, the defender may place up to three breach standees on any sections of a light or fortified wall. So that's kind of cool. They can also, not only can they place these extra little wall tokens to like build up some of these extra walls, they can also place particular breach tokens on some of them instead if they would like these. Like, you know what? I just want that wall broke open so I can see it. And again, sometimes breaking these walls open or leaving a door or window unbarricaded, um, you know, for example, wherever this would go, um, might 
might try and like lure the other player into that area or it might provide an escape route for you might be another option as well um, another one i've kind of went over some of these already tactical advance module we have um the new hidden action uh, the Defender reveals Operator tokens perform a new action called a Hide. When re revealed Operator spends one of their actions to hide, put your miniature back in the Operator profile, placing it to two Operator tokens stacked. The Operator with um, located markers cannot perform Hide action. If the Operator has a stun marker, correspond, add the corresponding marker to the stack of Operator tokens. When placing two tokens or in the same direction as the miniature they are replacing, Operators with stacked tokens do not lean or change their orientation. Operators cannot perform the hide action while leaning. Um, so while the hide oper op hidden operators revealed during their hidden operator tokens on their profile rather than putting them back in the box. So this is what I said before, I just think it should be part of the game. Is once you can't be seen, if you're the defender, you can kind of go back into hide and spread your tokens out. I This could actually make the game a lot harder are easier for defenders and I feel I feel like you should just always play that way and if it starts becoming too easy then remove that extra feature um this is another one I think should this is why I could go either way with I guess the overwatch action variant in this module overwatch is a free action performed automatically this gives attackers more of a margin for maneuver while also making things easier for the defenders um who might be using the action thus save for the hide um Playing the game without Overwatch markers during the setup, leave the Overwatch markers in the box to keep the entryway Overwatch tokens. Immediately before ending an Operator's activation, controller player reorients the Operator's miniature to indicate the Overwatch direction. So instead, he'd just be Overwatching that way, or he would be Overwatching that way. Um, yeah, so... The idea of this is that that just means any time your character is done with their turn, until their next turn and they're ready to activate or move again, they are automatically watching whatever doorway they're watching or watching the room or however it is. Um, which again, kind of makes sense to the gameplay. Um, your guy's not... Because you're not moving everybody at the same time. So I guess the theory would be is like, your guy doesn't just oh i moved i moved here and now i'm just standing they're not doing anything until my next turn comes around while these other guys are moving around it's like nope i'm sitting here waiting and watching to make sure anyone comes in so again it makes the defenders a little bit easier because then they don't have to spend the action music they can use it to hide or do something else especially like early on when um they're just kind of moving around and stuff. Uh, but it also gives the attackers a little bit extra thing. Because again, they don't have to use extra actions to stop and do that. Because they want to keep moving around the board and doing stuff. Defenders might want to sit in one spot for a while. So they're overwatching for them is fine. But it lets the attackers do it without having to waste extra turns stopping to do it. You know, because then they can like, oh, I can move and I have to overwatch. You know, instead now they can move and then using ability and then still overwatch. Um, yeah, so it's basically this. Uh, so this means entryways are always disputed at the end of an act, or at the end of a turn. Um, but it also makes that yeah, walking into any doorway necessary a lot more hard. Um, all right, so in the last little bit of that competitive gaming module, uh, best of three matches, operator selection, you can kind of, I pick one, then you pull in bands and operator. Um, uh, they picked them. So this is just letting you kind of, um, basically, I, I don't like, like, I hate playing against this character, and your opponent has the option to basically nullify that character. So that's an option there. Um, multiplayer mode, you can also play 2, 2v2. Um, begin the attackers, each squad player chooses one of the two available recruit profiles. Um, place the selected profile in the tactical squad area within reach of both players. Place six charges in the desired areas. Um, on the recruits profile, a player and a squad agrees which tactical guys to choose and how to deploy the recruit. Um, yeah, each player chooses two operators to control during the turn, and then you have the recruit being the 
uh, fifth fifth player of the team. Um, kind of like the mid guy that each guy can use. So it's, it's saying like I get to play as you know Blitz and uh, Monte there, and then my my other blue player just pick his two characters, and then we have one of the recruit characters, which is this guy, but in blue. Uh, but there's two different variations of them. And then they just, that's kind of the combined guy. Um, and they have their own little profile things too. They just don't have special effects. Um, all right, so then they tactically, which selection just activate first? Control and the section activate both their operators. Now she choose to activate the recruit. And then it does the same for the second player. So what that kind of does in limit doesn't change 2v2, is it? These are my two guys. During the first activation, if I go first, I can activate these two or my or my recruit, and then the other player doesn't activate till the next next one, um, and then you can decide kind of which way you go there. Um, so you option available during the upkeep phase. Um, uh, beginning of the round, tapping the level up recruit buttons grants you one minute, which should upgrade your recruits. So leveling up the recruit. Upgrade your recruit's effectiveness in any one range category um, by removing a desired cube from the range category from the recruit profile and put it back in the box. Uh, remove the first available cube from left to right and the chosen range. This should be a new guy to be rolled in the future uh, shot action. So here it's showing his different thing. I can take these off to basically give him more advantage. The charge, if a charge cube is shows an icon, leveling up the recruit also grants extra charge cubes so you can gain some of your inventory back. So that's kind of a neat extra little thing there as well. Um, and then assign charges, put cubes back in the box. Uh, reactions, reaction by operators, recruits may be cleared by either player and the squad. So that way if like player A see something but it's player b's character they can definitely call it out same thing with challenging during deployment players in a squad may communicate freely using leaving the table for private discussions so you might do that as well um you are the first player to activate your operas during a round the time will be running for both you and your squad mates so this does mean though that if player a you know they have that five minutes for your characters to activate and they take three minutes of it that means player b only has two minutes to do his activations so keep that in mind um real token share eliminated selection uh if a full selection is eliminated the player controlling the eliminated selection will not be able to activate any operators uh, so they can't even operate the recruiter anymore there's also three players 2v1 um defender may activate four other operators and they recruit in any order um, okay, a couple other things here, and then we are done with this. So, alternate profiles. There are alt characters in here. Any operator cannot play a character on their alt version simultaneously. Doing so might raise gameplay balance issues. But more importantly, we care a hole in the space fabric, space time continuum. Um, also, only contains one copy of each operator specific component. So, there are some characters like uh, Zero, and um, I think in the main game, it's. it's uh, in the base game, it's Tachanka and maybe Montag? No, not him. Um, who is the other guy? Uh, it's one of the orange guys. I don't remember who the other one was. Do we had two of? Um, but yeah, anyhow, we have Jagger was the other one. We have two versions of them. So, like, you can play them. They have the same special ability. They have different attack ratings, uh, which I kind of showed off in the very first video. But basically saying you can't use the same ones. There won't be the same number of components. Maybe if you got every expansion, you might have a different character that had the same, um, like, special effect. Like, maybe if they have an extra bulletproof camera that another character might have one you could use. Um, but, it, you know, there's enough characters that it's not really an issue. Um... Squad composition, although every operator is unique, that uh, the operator list lets you quickly assemble squad presence skills. This is the big sheet that shows a bunch of different stuff that shows what your characters might be good at. Um, some recommendations. Um, 
I'm not going to go over too much of these, but just one thing to keep in mind here. It says, uh, never forget every action comes. It's still shocking and dev devastating consequences. My only charging in the battle is never an option. Um, also, uh, one of the game's core concepts is destructible environment. Keep in mind, the environment can change and some shots can penetrate certain type of partitions. Exploit this weakness without overexposing your operators and then manage your time. Um, stuff about the defenders, the attackers, I'm not going to get too much into all that. Um, so that is what we have. Those are our rules. This is a very long set of two videos to go over all the different gameplay rules. I'm sure I missed little things here and there, but I tried to hit the basis of all of it. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys, if you watched this far, hey, thanks. I really appreciate it. Uh, come back, check out the next videos. We're going to start going over, um... The gear and the operators. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can put it into one video. But it might take a little while. Trying to actually talk and really describe how the operators work. And then I might end up having to put it into two videos. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, Alright, see you guys there. Bye.